Hello and welcome to this video which will be on the topic of neural network backpropagation with an activation function, a topic that was requested. Thank you for your comments and your requests keep on coming. So first of all, what is an activation function? You guys probably already know this, but let's look at it anyway. An activation function is simply the function that we apply to the outputs of a neural network. So we have the so-called input function, which is simply uh, the sum of the multiples of the weights and inputs. And you could say that that's the identity uh, output activation function, uh, but uh, we can apply some other activation function on that output as well. This one, for example, is the sigmoid or logistic function, which we'll be using in this video, very commonly used for probability outputs. Uh, because every output uh, that uh, comes out of this is going to be w in the range from 0 to 1. Uh, you could also use uh, step functions for binary classifiers, either 0 or 1. Uh, you could use arctangent, probably inside your deeper uh, dense layer network to prevent vanishing, uh, I mean, ex exploding gradients. Exploding gradients is a problem in uh, in deeper neural networks sometimes uh, where the gradients become very big and you have all sorts of uh, overflow problems and so on. Well, as you can see from the shape of this function, it kind of plateaus to the ends. And so the gradient actually approaches zero. So um, no exploding gradients. You might end up with a vanishing gradient though, but that's a different problem. Uh, in some cases, you might want to introduce periodicity by using trigonometric functions, cosine or sine. Um, and what you're basically saying there is something that happens uh, periodically should be marked as a, a positive activation, and that might be important in some application. Uh, similarly, as you all know, the rectified linear un unit is uh, very commonly used, uh, ReLU short, um, in convolutional neural networks, especially for uh, vision problems. This is basically a standard thing to do. What it allows is for the same network to learn different classes of objects. Um, and when it's learning one type of features, which causes activations in some part of the network, other parts of the network will go to zero and they will not be affected. So you can teach a network um, to detect cats and then in the next uh, moment, you can teach the network, the same network, cars. And the features of the cat will not come up, hopefully, when the car is being looked at. And so they won't be modified. And that allows for your network to um, properly see and retain the features pertaining to several classes of objects. As I said, we will be looking at the sigmoid function in this case. It's very commonly used. Um, in classification uh, problems. So you basically want the probability of an input belonging to a certain class. And this would uh, be on your final output layer, for example, so that your output is a sane, uh, guaranteed to be a sane probability value between zero and one. Uh, so from Wikipedia, we can see that the sigmoid function is often written in this form, one divided by one plus e to the power of minus x. And that's the form we'll be using. Uh, there's an interesting thing about the gradient or the derivative of this function, uh, which is that the derivative of the sigmoid function, and I really should have uh, written sigma instead of f here, um, is sigma times one minus sigma. So the, the output of the sigmoid function, which is this guy here, times one minus the sigmoid function value. So this is a special case. It is certainly not true of all functions f. All right, so we're going to be looking at a simple case with two neurons, two layers with one node each. And uh, the input in is simply the uh, input times a weight. <clears throat> so there is a weight uh, applied to this connection here. And we apply this output activation. Uh, so uh, ultimately, uh, it becomes uh, 1 divided by 1 plus e to the power of minus i w. Now, I looked at some of the code for TensorFlow, um, trying to find where they had implemented uh, 
uh, the sigmoid or logistic, as it's called sometimes, function, and I I couldn't find it, uh, and that's because it's uh, actually implemented in the Eigen library, and uh, then if you go into the Eigen source code, you can find in the unary functions .h that uh, they've actually implemented it the way that uh, we had it previously. So that that's the form that that um, is good to use, kind of reassuring to to see that we're in good company here. Uh, one divided by one plus e to the power of minus x. Similarly, the gradient we can find out. Uh, there's a function called scalar sigmoid gradient operation, and the gradient is the same as we saw earlier. So this time I have the sigma correctly there. Uh, it is the output of the sigma function times one minus that sigma output again. And uh, in front of this expression, we can see there's the output gradient. Now what this uh, obviously is referring to is uh, the gradient from the input to the sigma um, according to the chain rule, if you remember. So the rate of change of sigma with respect to x is the rate of change of um, g um, with respect to x times the rate of change of sigma with respect to x when there is uh, a function g as the argument to sigma being um, a function of x itself. Uh, so that all seems to make sense and uh, we seem to be writing things in the same format as they are so that's kind of a good thing. All right, so let's look at a randomized case. Uh, weights randomized to 0 0.8. We have the activation there, 1 divided by 1 plus e to the minus iw. And that's how we get the output activation. And uh, our target or desire, desired output is going to be 0 0.5. And of course, we use a cost function again. So we need to know how much the current activation is wrong. And the cost function, uh, again, we're going to use uh, uh, squared error here, as is very often done. You could say mean squared error. Uh, this time, there's no mean. There's just one value. And uh, then we ask our usual question. How should A change for error to decrease? So how much should the activation change for this um, squared uh, difference to decrease? And of course, because we can't change A directly, we have to ask ourselves, how should W change in order uh, for A to change in such a way that C, our cost function, um, gives a smaller error? And of course, uh, I cannot be changed. So let's start looking at this. Well, obviously, uh, as before, we need the gradient at e each step. So um, the rate of change of error, the error uh, with respect to the activation, is simply the derivative of this. So I just bring the two in front of the um, expression there. And uh, we have this convenient gradient here to answer the next question, which is how much should W change for A to change uh, in an appropriate way. And, and, and here we have the rate of change of the activation function. Um, and then uh, we can start writing all of this out again. And here we have once again the backpropagation function, you could call it. So W prime or the next uh, corrected version or better version of, of w is going to be the previous or let's say the current w uh, minus uh, learning rate times the rate of change of c with respect to our w that we are modifying here which is a variable that we can actually uh, modify and uh, if you remember uh, from the previous video r is set at some small value below one uh, so 0 0.01 uh, or something like that. Uh, you have to experiment a little bit, depends on the size of your network and so on. Uh, and again, we can substitute uh, 
for this expression, we can we can take according to the chain rule uh, these two derivatives and just stuff them in there and multiply them together, and we have the correct answer. Uh, substituting what we've already put in here, we get this, which turns into a surprisingly complicated looking expression. Um, and finally, when we, we put um, the actual sigmoid function, the activation function in there, it, it becomes even more complicated looking. And uh, I'll talk about that complication in just a little bit. But because we are dealing with computers, we already have what we need. This is how we change w. And uh, let's do that now. So with this input 1.5 um, and the rate of change, I'm sorry, uh, learning rate 0 0.1 and the target being 0 0.5, let's go ahead and do some calculations. So we have all the pieces we need. We have the weight set at 0 0.8. We have the activation, which has been calculated uh, to be that. Uh, we have the rate of change of A with respect to W at 0 0.178, and the rate of change of C with respect to A at 0 0.537. Again, these are values uh, that are obtained uh, by simply putting in all the numbers um, as, as they've been defined here. And then we go to the first iteration, and uh, you'll notice that the activation starts to very, very slowly uh, change, uh, decrease, in fact, uh, getting closer to 0 0.5. Now, you'll notice it's very slow, and that's one of the characteristics of the sigmoid function. It kind of plateaus up here. Uh, it doesn't have a very uh, steep slope downwards, so we're just going slowly downwards here. And we could help that situation by increasing the learning rate um, to 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on, and, and get to the activation faster if we wanted to. That's typically not a good idea um, because you might end up in the wrong uh, minimum, especially if your network is very complicated. Of course, in our case, uh, the network is so simple that uh, we could probably use this kind of a learning rate. But typically, uh, doing um, 10 or 100 times more iterations is no problem. So there you have it. That's how you do it. That's, that's how the back propagation would work. Now, since things are getting a little bit more complicated here, I wanted to um, mention a few things about how derivatives or gradients um, are actually calculated in deep learning software. And uh, they actually have the concept, if you want to look it up, of auto differentiation. And uh, basically, since we're dealing with numerical methods here, um, everything needs to be calculated one way or another. Uh, you cannot uh, have derivatives in closed form and then just uh, use them as you need them Rather, what is done is when you do the so-called forward pass uh, and you calculate each activation, of course, uh, usually you have more than one layer, uh, you calculate not only the activation, but also since you know how to calculate the gradient of that activation layer with respect uh, to the previous layer, you do that as well. And we have everything we need to be able to put that number in here. And so we, we make a note of that. And we record onto this so-called tape. Um, that's a technical term. You can look it up. Um, this uh, derivative. And it may very well be that this won't be used in the future. And especially when you have a multidimensional case, it may be uh, discarded. But it's there for if you need it for when you're doing back propagation. Similarly, we have the derivative of the cost function and we can make a note of that as well. And this is one of the reasons why it takes so much memory to train neural networks, because you're not just recording the activation. In this case, you're recording um, twice as much 
data uh, for the gradients. And, and then you would simply, when you do backpropagation, you no longer have to do any calculations. You just pick up the numbers that you left and, uh, and that makes things fast, but also accurate because we have um, the accurate original numbers in use as we do this. And of course, it relies heavily on the chain rule. We have this kind of local derivative here, um, which is not helpful unless you have all the other derivatives available to you as well. Um, and this is something that we looked at in a, in a previous video. So in a more generalized case, you would backpropagate and at each step, when you are calculating the new value of the weight in question, you take the rate of change of the previous, which is already present here and has already been calculated, and you multiply it by uh, this local activations uh, gradient with respect to, to this weight. And that's, that's how you know uh, by how much you should modify that weight. And, and you go back and every single time you only have to deal with that number that you've recorded uh, before. <coughs> and so I showed this example previously. Um, and this is exactly what it would look like in our case as well. Uh, we would have to substitute t for y actually in this slide. So that's it. Uh, thank you for watching. And if you have any questions or comments, please put those below.